Dr. Joel Furman is a board certified family physician who has shown for over 30 years that it is possible to achieve sustainable weight loss and to reverse heart disease, reverse diabetes, and many other diseases using smart nutrition. Through his medical practice, which is based in uh, both in New York and in California, through his medical practice, his books, and various television specials, he brings this vital message to hundreds of thousands of people around the world. Diabetes is not a one-way street. Dr. Furman's books are available in India, and I highly recommend them. Um, Dr. Furman, thank you for bringing your message to members of the Life Heal family today. For all, for all our new viewers, Life Heal was started in India by myself, Junior Gupta, and I was inspired by Dr. Furman and decided to bring this knowledge to India and with Indian characteristics, especially to treat people like my parents. Life Heal consults clients using this scientific approach and have helped many people stop insulin, repair kidneys, reverse fatty livers, and just about everyone loses a lot of weight. I also want to stress if you are diabetic and following any advice you receive here, you must do it under proper guidance as medications reduce within days and within hours. Uh, for all the Zoom and also YouTube participants, the call will be on mute and kindly send your questions in on the chat, which is available. I have monitoring both of those. So Dr. Furman, we are very excited to bring your knowledge to India. So why don't we start? Excited to talk to you today and, and see each everybody face to face. Sounds great. Thank you. So Dr. Furman, let me begin with this question. Uh, right now, we are in a coronavirus pandemic time, and it especially seems to impact diabetics and then they're on the morbidly obese. So for those who are diabetic, what should they be doing right now during this pandemic? Well, the same thing that everybody else should be doing who's not diabetic. In other words, um, when you're overweight, you can't be in good health. There's no such thing as an overweight, healthy person. That's first of all, because fat on the body is pathologic tissue. It's hypoxic tissue. It throws off lipokines and cytokines. It, what I'm saying is hypoxic tissue is fat cells don't have a great blood supply. They don't get good, good oxygenation, good um, penetration of antioxidants, and they spew out more reactive oxygen species. They're a pro-inflammatory um, substance on the body that activates your white blood cells to be chronically inflamed all the time. So people who are overweight have higher circulating white blood cell activity. It's like keeping the battery in the flashlight. It's like keeping the flashlight on all the time. So when you go to use it, the battery's burned out. It doesn't, it's not gonna have a lot of power. When you eat a diet that's rich in phytonutrients and you have a lower amount of body weight, your, white blood, your circulating white blood cells go down precipitously. Of course, we know other, other parameters, like in other words, fat cells um, activate aromatase enzymes, which raise estrogen, increasing risk of breast and prostate cancer. And fat cells promote angiogenesis, which is, um, allows tumors to replicate. So we're saying, number one, a person has certain biological factors occurring that allow cytokine storm and, and excessive inflammation to occur in response to a virus like COVID-19. That's number one. However, when a person starts dropping weight at about a kilogram a week, that's when a person has lap band or, or gastric bypass surgery, their insulin resistance goes down within four weeks, even while they're still overweight. They can still be 50 pounds overweight, and then maybe they'll get off their insulin, become non-diabetic, because they dropped 15 to 20 pounds that first month. Because you immediately start reducing inflammation, improving insulin sensitivity, and reducing aromatase stimulation, you start seeing improvements dramatically. And we find that our, at our um, retreats and things, when people have high inflammatory markers or um, bad metabolic parameters, as long as we keep them losing at about a kilogram a week, we see these things improve dramatically 
the reason I'm saying this right now is I'm saying whether you're diabetic or not, within a few weeks of eating what I call a nutritarian diet and adequately dropping your weight, you can, you can improve your health and reduce your resistance to COVID-19 more than a hundred fold just because you're following this nutritional program, which on one hand floods the body with phytonutrients to enable the immune system to act, um, to act more normally. And number two, we're getting rid of the dangers of the excess fat in the body, even while the person is still overweight, as long as they're steadily losing weight and moving towards their ideal weight. What I'm saying right now is that a true nutritarian, a pro, well, the word nutritarian means eating for ideal health, a person who eats for optimal health and optimal longevity. But you're a nutritarian if you're at your ideal weight or you're not at your ideal weight and you're moving steadily in that direction every single week. The minute, the minute you're at an abnormal weight but you're not losing weight, then you're really not following a nutritarian approach because the primary principle of this approach is moderate caloric restriction in the context of micronutrient excellence. And we modulate the micronutrient content of our diet and the fiber content with using foods with a low caloric density to give us enough, enough food volume and satisfaction to be able to keep our caloric density sufficiently to keep ourselves slim and fit and lean. And so that, so a thorough understanding of these basic principles can enable people who are adequately motivated to be able to achieve great health, to achieve, to get the, to get the results they want. And with your first question about COVID-19, it's that there should be, COVID-19 is a harmless virus to a healthy person. It's completely harmless. So there, there's no fear at all. And fear is not good for people's health. It's only dead harmful and even deadly to people who are sick or those who are eating unhealthfully. And it just demonstrates the ubiquitous, the, the worldwide consumption of junk food, processed foods, flours, oils, sugars, salts. It just shows you how processed food has invaded the modern world the fact that we're allowing this simple coronavirus to kill people. It's just total insanity. Thank you for that. Um, so speaking of phytonutrients, in India, we don't have a big tradition of eating salads. Is salads one of the primary ways of getting phytonutrients or do cooked vegetables also retain a lot of their phytonutrients? And a follow on is if somebody is overweight right now, can they build up some immunity by taking extra phytonutrients during this time? No, not really. I mean, a little bit, you know, but not, not much because that's the whole like um, myth of where of, of people think they continue to eat, you know, French fries and pizza and donuts and then take some supplements and try to achieve good health. It's just, a, it's just doomed to failure. You know, they, a, a, a supplement is additional to, a, to an excellent diet. It's not like you, instead of an excellent diet, you know, and what, a br piece of broccoli has a, probably 500 different nutrients in it. It's not just the, the sulfurophane in broccoli that makes it so healthy. You extract the sulfurophane out of the broccoli and you take a pill and you don't have the same effect as eating real broccoli. You say the most, but to, let's do your first question first. And that's um, raw vegetables versus cooked vegetables. Um, some of these powerful anti-cancer substances in green cruciferous vegetables called isothiocyanates are formed in the mouth as you chew the vegetable because you break down the cell wall which houses a packet. A little in the cell wall is a membrane packet containing the enzyme myrosinase. And as the myrosinase enzyme is, is broken, is liberated and mixed with the glucosinolate in the, in the in the cell vacuole, you form ITCs, isothiocyanates in the mouth. Those are perhaps the most powerful immune supporting and anti-cancer substances in the diet. The myrosinase enzyme is, is heat sensitive. So if you overcook the broccoli or the kale or the bok choy or the cabbage, if you cook it first, you'll deactivate the myrosinase and then when you chew it, you won't have the formation. So we, we, I do recommend people eat a salad every day. And 
we recommend they chew every mouthful to a liquid before they allow it to be swallowed to maximize their production of isothiocyanates. And that means they use bok choy or cabbage or arugula or some kind of um, cruciferous green raw on their salad. Then when they make their vegetable bean soup or their stew, and they're putting cabbage or onion, and by the way, there's an, un, there's an enzyme in onion called alliinase, A-L-L-I-I-N-A-S-E, alliinase. That, that's when you cut the onion, why you, you release sulfenic acid and other organosulfide compounds that make your eyes burn. And you're forming these, or, these organic anti-cancer immune supporting substances. Onion forms is rich in quercetin, it's rich in a lot of beneficial, um, very, very helpful substances, scallions and leeks and onions. But we're, we shred some scallion or red onion on the salad too, but if we're gonna use those substances cooked in a dish or a stew, the trick to maintain the nutrients is to blend them, puree them, so you break open the cells and form the ITCs or the, the compounds in the blender. Or if you're putting the onion, you can't blend it, chop it very finely. And then if you add it to the soup or the stew, you have, will have formed the beneficial compounds in the blender or in your chopping bowl. And then if you cook it, in a water base, a stew or a water base or a soup, you will not destroy the anti-cancer compounds that are formed. So yes, we can get some of those beneficial compounds from cooked foods, but we get them more effectively from raw food. And it's combining the raw and the cook that makes the diet so ideal. Like my, I advocate that people have a nice chopped salad for lunch with a bowl of vegetable bean soup and one piece of fruit for dessert. So I want, and I want the lunch salad to contain the, the green vegetables, maybe tomatoes and onions and scallion and you know, you know, cucumber, peppers, whatever, all these things you're putting on a salad. And then the secret sauce here is not to use oil as a dressing because oil sabotages the benefits of the salad. Um, we, we make a dressing from nuts and seeds that are blended with a tomato sauce or a base or roasted garlic or or we make a, you know, a, a fruit, a berry and vinegar sauce. We make all these different, or we make a sauce for the vegetables, a Thai curry sauce, but the, but the sauces and the flavorings are not made with oil because the, one, of the, one of the key factors that sabotages people's weight loss and sabotages their reversal of diabetes is putting oil on their food. And we can, I'd like to, we can talk more about that. But, but ideally we want people to have a mixture of raw and cooked, not just raw and not just cooked. Okay. And for people watching this, you know, we have taken Dr. Furman's knowledge and developed Indian uh, dressings that use Indian ingredients and you can do it from any shop that is within five minutes of your house. Um, I'll bring, I'll come to the oil question uh, maybe in, after a, a point, but I wanted to go back to a bigger question which is that in India, people still find it difficult to believe that diabetes can be cured. They just have been so unexposed to a different type of thought process since childhood. Even I was told, once you get diabetes, it never goes away. So what can you tell them about this belief that they have been brainwashed since childhood into believing? Um, I don't think that's unique to India in any way. I mean, don't you think most people in the United States or other parts of the world think the same way? Pro I think probably, you know. I mean, I think that the, um, the development of medical care, which have taken over, the people have, believe, have developed this belief system to think that we get better health and take care of our health by going to doctors and taking drugs, and that that's the answer to our health problems, which in most cases um, reinforces the idea that health comes from taking a pill as opposed to living a healthful life. Um, I, I think that most nutritional scientists around the world um, and, and lifestyle medicine specialists, you know, and even most physicians actually know that being overweight is not predominantly genetic and it's a reversible condition. And, and type two diabetes is, is a dietary induced illness and is largely reversible. 
I mean, we should differentiate between type one and type two for a minute right. in that a type one diabetic has no more ability to secrete insulin and eating the way I recommend for a type one is critically important because it could save their life or take, you know, or save them from having un un incredible amount of tragedies and hardships and it reduces their insulin needs by more than a half. The problem with going to a diabetologist or endocrinologist to, to treat your type one is they give you as much insulin you, as you need to control your blood sugars in the favorable range. And that's not good for a type one. They should be restricting their insulin use and making sure they eat a diet that's healthy enough that they don't require that as much insulin to maintain their sugars in the most favorable range. They can't just let people eat whatever they want and give them more insulin. It has the type one become overweight because excess insulin promotes cancer and, promote, and, and, is a, and accelerates your death. It's the excess insulin that you, that you allow to have to control the blood sugar that causes all the damage in type one. So whether there's a type one can't get rid of their diabetes completely or usually can't, they have a few childhood onset type ones, three to five year olds who have gotten well, gotten completely cured of it because they started this program right at the very beginning instantaneously with their diagnosis. But generally speaking, a type one can't get rid of it. Now a type two diabetic is a person who has adequate insulin production. But now they've, after years of being overweight, you know, don't forget when you're developing 10 pounds in your body, 20 pounds, 30 pounds extra, the amount of insulin produced by the beta cells in the pancreas might be three to eight times as much insulin might be needed to keep your sugars in good control. But the beta cells keep pushing out all that excess insulin to accommodate all the white rice, all the oil, the destruction of the um, insulin receptors from saturated fats, from butter and ghee. I mean, we've, we've destroyed our insulin receptors and so they become insulin resistant. So the beta cells respond by producing higher and higher amounts of insulin to get the glucose out of the blood. Now, as long as the beta cells can respond by producing five to 10 times as much insulin as a slim healthy eating person could have needed, you're not diabetic. Right. But the problem, did, did, the person didn't develop diabetes or the person didn't develop a problem when they developed diabetes. They have a problem way before the diabetes ever appeared because excess insulin accelerates their aging process and creates disease. And insulin resistance and, and excess insulin, that combination without diabetes is still dangerous. They're aging their body and causing damage before their blood sugar even starts to rise. But after years of the beta cells producing too much insulin, they start to poop out a little bit and they can only produce one and a half to two times as much insulin as a thin person would have needed. But, but whatever they're producing now is not enough for this person with such a high degree of insulin resistance and the blood sugars then start to rise. A person with type two diabetes usually can produce enough insulin for a norm that will accommodate a normal diet and a normal body weight. They just can't produce enough insulin to accommodate an overweight body and a diet and a, a diet that's glycemically unfavorable or insulin receptor unfavorable. Now, as this person not just loses weight, but as they start to rest the beta cells, so they're not being overstressed anymore, and you supply the body with enough phytonutrients and an overall symphonic orchestra of all nutrients that the human body needs, the beta cells can start to, some of them can come back and their activity can improve. What I'm saying is you have some beta cell death, but you also have some hibernating beta cells that are not quite dead yet. And with excellent health, they can be, and, with, and without, with not overusing them to be pushing them to work to death, they can come back to normal function again. I'm saying right now that my 30 years of experience has had more than 90% of my type two diabetics become non-diabetic. And that, um, the, and becoming who have followed this program, and I defining non-diabetic as having an in, a fasting blood sugar below 100 routinely without the use of medication. Amazing. So, so we can go into that more if you want, but I mean, um, yeah, I actually, for, for the type the recovery, diabetes. the recovery of the diabetes without the medication is life saving because some of the medications cause weight gain. Some of the medications push the failing beta cells that have now been overworked 
to produce too much insulin, they push them to produce more insulin. So the Klebotas blood sugar is down. The physician and the diabetologist and the endocrinologist concerned with the, or the doctor so concerned with the blood sugar being normal are not concerned with the beta cells being wiped out being, and the beta cells placed under further stress to produce more insulin than accelerates their poop out leading to an advancement of the diabetes and the development of a type one and a half diabetic who's been overly medicated for all these years. And now the diet is not gonna work as effectively on this type one and a half diabetic who's been beta cells have been over pushed by medications for so many, for, for decades already. Interesting. Yeah, it is a growing problem in India as well, the type one and a half a diabetic. So right. on that point, actually, I would love to know for a type two diabetic, what would be the top three things people can do at home to reduce their diabetes? Well, you know, I think that every diabetic should know their body fat percent, you know, because you, you don't have a normal male if uh, health wise, if their body fat's over 15% body fat, and you don't have a normal female um, if, if their body fat's over 25% body fat. So to me, it's not just the pr normal parameters that doctors measure, but I think they should accurately know their body fat too. And it's not just walking and you know, exercise, I think that they should try to, and the combination of the diet with regular exercise can train their body to become, to have a, a low body fat percent. And of course, we're talking about what they can do is this whole portfolio, this whole dietary portfolio of vegetables and beans and nuts and low glycemic fruits without oil and sweeteners and flowers and animal products is the main thing. I mean, a person can use a very, if they want to use a tiny amount of an animal product or something. But the main thing is that they have to get off the flour and the oil and get their carbohydrates from beans and lentils, which are lower glycemic. You know, so what I'm saying right now is that they have to stop sabotaging their health by eating like other people eat. Because if they do what they've done so far, they're not going to get better and they're just going to keep deteriorating. You know, it's funny when a person comes to me as a patient, and I say, look, are you here just to make improve a little bit or you wanna to totally get rid of your diabetes and get totally well and get rid of your heart disease, get off your medications, get rid of your headaches, get rid of your fibromyalgia. Do you wanna totally get well and get to a thin, healthy person or you're just here to dabble? You know, and they say, no, I wanna do this. You wanna lose 20 pounds this first month or you just wanna you know, lose a few pounds. You wanna get back to your perfect weight. You want to do and they say, yeah, I want the whole program. I wanna do exactly what you say. I wanna do, I wanna lose the 15 pounds the first month. I wanna lose 10 pounds the second month. I want to lose 25 pounds in eight weeks. I want to get back. I'm going to lose 50 pounds within four months. I'm going to get back. Not. I'm going to get all my, I want to do everything you want. Okay. So I tell them, well, then don't decide what you're going to eat. And don't think what you know what you should eat or should not eat. And don't, let's not focus on what you think, what you feel like eating or what you want to eat or what you can, you know, because all those things that drove your eating behaviors over the last few years didn't work, did they? This is where you are. Now we're going to do it differently. Now I'm gonna decide what you eat. And you're just not gonna be feeling about whether you like it or whether you, or how much, you know, what you felt. And we're gonna prove scientifically if this works or not. But I'll prove to you though, that if you do this program, you will love eating this way, but you'll only love it if you give it some months of doing it. You're not gonna start out loving it. You obviously like what you're doing now, otherwise you wouldn't be overweight and diabetic. So what I'm saying right now is that your taste buds change and get stronger. And you adapt and you like things you get used to doing. And though there's an initial feel of, of loss in this food addict who's recreational eating and has trouble changing their diet, unless they make a significant change in what they're doing that has to be fairly radical, how do they expect their diabetes to go away? If they're not willing to cut out all the oil, they're not gonna get better because oil halts lipolysis. It prevents fat loss. It, it distorts the insulin receptor. It makes you insulin resistance and it's fattening. You can't get rid of the fact is that oil is fattening. It doesn't matter what oil they're taking in. If they're pouring oil on their food, they're not gonna gain, gain these great results. So, the, so when you said, what's the first thing they do? They've gotta be willing. The first thing that's changed, it has to occur up here, right? It has to occur up there. They have to be, you have to first take the initiative to learn and then you have to have 
determination and perseverance to do the program. And whether you feel that it's so enjoyable or not at the beginning, because it takes time to change your weight, your, your taste buds and your food preferences, and you have recipes and recipe techniques to learn to make this taste good. So it's a learning process. You know, Roger Federer didn't develop that most perfect tennis swing in a few days or a few weeks. And he became a great tennis player because he obviously he was willing to perfect the technique and not care about winning or losing when he was young with great coaching. He did, he had to repeat the right motions where he has his, his wrist coming back just the right way, his elbows staying up on the, you know, he, ha he has the perfect style. His, his bracket comes in the perfect position. He drops it just the right angle to the ground. The elbow comes a crop of rough the, the chin before he starts to let the, the arm bend. He does all these things that are so perfect. You don't develop perfect technique like that trying to win a match when you're a kid. You have to be willing to play and not worry about winning or losing. You have to be able to get instruction and listen to the coach and repeat it over and over and over again so it becomes natural. Mem so your body has like memory and automatically does it that way. People have to have deter initiative, determination, perseverance, and repetition of doing the right things. And then the magic starts to happen. And when you do this 90%, you're not gonna get, you may not get optimal results. What I'm saying right now is that the money's in the last 10%. Because if you wanna see the magic happen, you gotta be willing to do this all the way. Because then, you, then the diabetes really goes away. The minute you keep doing all these little things to sabotage yourself, you're gonna take away your possibility to really get better. But not only that, by dabbling in these addictive substances like, like breads and oils and cookies and, you know, and, what, by, and, by, and fried foods, by dabbling these things, by having a little bit of things you shouldn't be eating, it makes you want to crave them more. It makes you want to keep eating them. And, you, and it keeps you with a foot in both worlds, always a food addict, desirous of those things that, are, that you shouldn't be having. But the minute you cut that cord and go onto this program with 100% determination, the desire for those substances gradually fade away because you're not having them anymore. It's like the alcoholic who goes out and gets drunk on the weekends. If, you, if the alcoholic stays away from the alcohol or the cigarette smoker stays away from the cigarettes or the cocaine addict stays away from the cocaine long enough for enough months or even years, those things stop calling their name. They don't want them anymore, but they gotta cut the cord and stay away from those things to not want them anymore. Hmm. It's this, you know, I'm, I'm advocating, my years and decades of experience have seen that the people that make the, get the best results are those who um, aren't like, that are going for this all the way, going for the gold and sticking with this and have clear boundaries at what they're allowing themselves to do and not stepping over that boundary line. And once they're achieved their great, once they do this long enough and they're not addicts anymore, then occasionally going over that boundary is not gonna bother them because they're not gonna be driven back to do that often yeah. and go over the boundary once in a while, but it's not when you're starting out and you're still being pulled back into that world by your addictive habits. So that's very insightful, Dr. Furman. I was not expecting that answer, but what I'm gathering is that it all begins with, with you. Yeah. And uh, for all the people sending their questions, we'll be getting to those very shortly. I uh, just have one more question to ask Dr. Furman before we take the audience's questions. So Dr. Furman, you know, we were sending cooked food here in India to so many of our clients and it was all following your nutritarian diet. So a lot of salad, no oil, nuts and seeds, two times a day, sometimes three. And, uh, but one challenge is what is a typical Indian meal? So in North India, a typical Indian meal involves a wheat flatbread, which we call roti. So it's wheat flour made into a flatbread, uh, lentils, and then a cooked a veg vegetable dish. Could be cauliflower, could be peas. Uh, very often it is potatoes. So for all the people listening here, 
is that good for diabetes and obesity or what would you suggest on how people can improve on that especially since they have been eating from age of one or two having that bread with something else and you must be dealing with people across all cultures so i'm sure i'm not the first one asking you this uh, of course i mean every so the people here in the united states are eating hamburgers and french fries and they're having bread at every meal too it's the cake diet they have you know i call it the cake diet because they have flour at every single meal practically and then you have people all across asian countries who are eating white white rice which is high glycemic it's not just india where people are um, used to eating flour and, and, and high glycemic carbohydrates like white rice, it's, it's almost all over the world. You know what I mean? Um, so you have to, get, but that's the problem. The, the little bit of flour they were eating with the vegetables and the beans wasn't so bad for, for many decades, but then we started, it, it, it was not a healthy diet, but it maybe was okay for most people until you started throwing it over the edge by adding oil and, and soft drinks and fast food and more animal products and more, you know, you got to a point where it just exploded. But to get well, you have to really get rid of those higher glycemic carbohydrates because flour comes from a wheat kernel or a wheat berry. And when that wheat kernel or wheat berry is intact and you, if you cooked it in water, like you cook a, um, like a steel cut oat or, a, or a, you know, a, Kamut or quinoa, though quinoa and kamut are, are whole grains that are intact, that you cook in water. You don't grind it into a flour and make it into a bread. Could, but as you grind the wheat berry into a flour, and then the finer you grind it, the more glycemic it becomes. So whole wheat pastry flour is more glycemically stressful on the body than whole wheat coarsely ground flour. Maybe you can grind the wheat berry so, or sprouted wheat so it's more coarsely ground. We, we have some frozen breads available in some health food stores in America where the bread is made from a mixture of different types of sprouted grains that are more coarsely ground. So the bread is not so fine and, and powder-like, you know, and, but people, you know, it doesn't, not the most favorite way people like the bread. The point I'm making right now is that if they're diabetic, they should probably just cut out the flour, the bread right now. It doesn't matter what they're used to eating or they traditionally eat. Or they, they've got to make a change if they want to get well. And their, most of their carbohydrate has to come from um, lentils and chickpeas and other beans, but they have to use more soybean in their diet too because a soybean is a bean with a low carbohydrate um, level. Um, dried soybeans that can be soaked and reconstituted and made into stews and soups and you can make and you can use make tempeh and other products but they have to use a diet with greens onions mushrooms eggplant cauliflower peas squashes but also use most of the carbohydrate and you can use soybeans and other beans and they're and if they're using grains their grains should be totally intact like a little bit of quinoa or a little bit of squash or a little bit of wheat berry but they shouldn't be grinding it and making it into a bread if they want to, because there aren't they doing this to get rid of their diabetes? Why should they be compromising and doing things half? Why should they be in this constant fight which you've been doing it halfway? And then they're gonna complain, you don't see the great results. And if you don't see the great results and your diabetes is not going away, it takes away your motivation to do it. I would rather do it all the way and not, not make it like acceptable for these people who want us to leave their bread. I probably would just, cut it out, cut out the bread and, and, make, and make it clear that the grains should be intact, water cooked, not ground to a flour and formed into a loaf or a, or a type of bread. Hmm, interesting. And uh, what you said reminds me for all the people here in India, you know, as a child, if I'm talking to my parents and they absolutely refuse to give up bread and, and I just wanna do something that is marginally better, if you take that wheat or your atta and it is more coarsely ground, if you get it ground locally and you get it coarsely ground, you can also insert some flax seeds when it's not the peak of the summer, then um, the coarsely ground atta will cause less of a glycemic spike than the finely ground attas. Of course, um, it, if you avoid it altogether and if you just have chickpeas or beans your glycemic spike will be the lowest and you'll have more protein 
but if you are having if you if you've got a family member who is not agreeing to anything else you can change the effects and moderate the glycemic spike by just having it coarsely ground absolutely and you could also put other ingredients in the bread too you know um but like mushrooms in the bread but okay but um yeah let me say this that um still we're tweaking the food both the type of food and the amount of food if the person is overweight to maintain that rate of weight loss of two of one kilogram a week if they're significantly overweight then they should be making the like let's say your parents for example um, yeah. i don't know who, the, who we're talking about but people are at risk of death with covid19 and they have to right now is a great time to motivate people make the change they need to make and whatever change they agreed to make if they're not losing weight and they're still overweight then the change they made is not sufficient they might have to modulate something further because they have to be moving towards a healthier weight if they want to live and not be at risk of dying of COVID-19. And the same healthy body that's going to result in. So I'm saying, you know, make sure what you're doing is getting results. And every person can't do the exact same thing because we all have different, we're all a little different. So we have to be able to modulate the diet a little bit to make sure we get results. When people come to my retreat here in San Diego and stay for a few months, I want to, I adjust their diets and sometimes individually I have to tweak it. So a person, I have this woman, let's say, who does very difficult time losing weight. So I have to make her diet a little more maybe with eggplant and cauliflower and soybean and a little, and I got to make, make it a little stricter so she can't have as much um, maybe of the, of the squash or the sweet potato or she can't have as much, you know, so I'm, I'm making some of the adjustments to her diet to make sure I can keep, make sure she's losing weight. And that means that um, even in a very difficult to lose weight loss person, I want to at least have them losing half a kilogram a week. Yeah. You know what I mean? So make sure that with the modulation of what you're doing, the person still weighs themselves twice a week to make sure that they're making progress because what's the, the effort to change has to result in some motivational benefits they can see on paper. Yeah. And the most important thing is to make sure that weight, if they're overweight, that their weight is coming down and they're eating enough green vegetables and enough raw and enough low, low glycemic fruits. And I, you know, my acronym G bombs, greens, beans, onions, mushrooms, berries, and seeds, greens, beans, onions, mushrooms, berries, and seeds. Go back to the basics, eat more greens. If you have to eat more, you know, eat more, and we know the lower sugar fruits, the eggplant, the peppers, the tomatoes, the onions, the mushrooms, the cauliflower, all these things have very low amount of calories and all, you know, super low in calories. You can eat more volume of foods that are really low in calories to make sure that you're going to adjust, modulate your weight so it is coming down appropriately. Thank you. So I've got a question here from a lady named Manpreet, a very, common question I get is, please talk about stevia. Is it recommended for diabetics? How much should I take? Or should, uh, do you have a take on any other artificial sweeteners? Yes, um, I'm a person who recommends eating none of those things. Well, you no, know, look, I'm not diabetic and I'm not overweight, but I wouldn't eat that because what do I need it for? I'm not putting sweeteners in, I'm not making baked goods with sweeteners in it. My desserts are made from fruit or frozen fruit. The fruit supplies sufficient sweetness. I wouldn't want to increase the sweetness over and above what a piece of fruit can give. Why would I be looking to do that? There's something perverted about the whole question because whether the, whether the sweetener has calories or not, it keeps you desirous of more sweetened substances. It's an addiction, it's acquired taste. A, ba a banana, a frozen banana mixed with some nuts and a little bit of real vanilla bean powder is plenty sweet for an ice cream. You don't need to add something sweetener on top of that. All, all I'm saying is that when people use these low calorie sweetener, it perpetuates their desire to have more sweets and it makes them want to, it, it keeps them addicted to wanting to eat sweetened substances and flour products and baked goods. And, and you shouldn't be drinking sweet liquids anyway. You shouldn't be putting sweeteners in a liquid. It, it's, a, it's not really favorable 
um, to dopamine stimulation in the brain either, making you want to eat more food and want to eat more calories. So you have the low calorie sweeteners and you still want sweeteners. They keep, they keep you wanting that food. When you cut that cord, cut the umbilical cord and you stop having no sweeteners, you start to taste the sweetness in a strawberry. You could, a, a romaine lettuce tastes sweet. You start, a cashew nuts have more sweetness. When you're not over bombarding your body with these sweet sensations, then real natural foods start to have more flavor. And one of the ways we achieve that is by taking the extra salt and the extra sweeteners and all the high, and so much of the high spices out of the diet so they can start to enjoy the flavor of natural foods better. That's a good point. Uh, sugar for, for the, uh, who asked uh, Manpreet, it's very addictive. I used to not eat desserts, but while counseling other people, I started having it to make better desserts for them. And now I crave desserts after dinner and it's a terrible thing that I want to stop. Um, Ritu Jain has a question. Uh, should type two diabetics avoid dairy products as well? Yes, absolutely especially saturated, especially saturated fat, because um, number one, dairy products are growth promoting food. You know, they're important for a person who's anorexic or starving. They help animals triple their weight in the first few weeks of life and are designed to rapidly grow a species of animals they're designed for. I were talking, and we're talking mostly, I presume, about milk from a cow, and a design, a cow is an 800 pound animal, it's a huge animal designed to grow from a rapidly and put on weight. So the, there's all these growth hormones in dairy products. Particularly, they, they allow the body to produce IGF-1. They're very IGF-1 promoting insulin-like growth factor one. And insulin-like growth factor one binds to the insulin receptor. It, it accelerates and worsens diabetes. What I'm saying right now is that dairy products worsen diabetes because they promote IGF-1, insulin-like growth factor one to levels that are too high. We want to keep IGF-1 below 150, maybe even below 130. As in, in the average, eating dairy products, it shoots it up there. And then, and then if you're having saturated fat, where you're, not, where you're eating dairy fats, the saturated fats distort the shape of the insulin receptor. So now that when you have something like a piece of fruit or some oatmeal, or, or peas or carrots, then you're gonna have a higher glycemic response because you ate those saturated fats. So getting, being on a very low fat diet where the only fat comes from a moderate use of nuts and seeds is one way that we get the insulin receptors to start to work normally again. Great. Um, I know we're reaching the end of the time and I know you kind of covered it, but I do have a question it was one I had written before, and Utsa Kohli is asking me this. Food addicts, how to get over it? We know we need to cut the cord. We know we need to change it. Any tips from your experience on how to get a food addict to stop maybe emotional eating or the sugar addiction? I mean, what should they do? You know, they, they have to read about mindfulness and about how to go after pleasure in life by having you know, be, being thoughtful and goodwill for others and being able to emote and care for other people. They, they have to realize that, um, that this is a change of mind, not just a change of diet. They have to realize that their food no longer becomes their primary mode of recreation and survival is, is, is eating food. That food has to be a secondary thing where your primary source of pleasure in life has to come from relations and your passions and the and the beauty of the world and other things besides. So they have to change the way they see food, number one. But the other thing is they need help because they need help in making sure they abstain from their addictive food triggers for a long enough period of time. That means that dabbling doesn't work. And by needing help, you need a support structure. And when you try to come off cigarette smoking, you tell everybody you're gonna quit and then have everybody encourage you to quit and make sure you don't have those smoking around you in your environment or in front of your face. So make sure your friends and your family and your coworkers know your plan, know that you're quitting eating unhealthy foods, list the foods you're going to eat and share it with everybody and ask for their help and make sure you don't have them in your house, you don't have them in your environment and the people that care about you and love you are gonna help you stay away from those addictive triggers. Get support. 
You know, you know that we have a retreat where people come here for two or three months and they're, they're not tempted to eat those foods because they're not around. They're taught how to make these foods taste good, but there's no temptation because there's no choice to have those foods. So people have to set that up in their own environment. They have to get those foods out of the house or get the other family members to eat their foods in a different part of the house. And they have to need other support to help them stay. It's hard for an alcoholic to stay away from alcohol when they're hanging around a bar every night. We have to get our environment. We have to have our environment be protected. And we have to have people we, that care about us help us stay away from those temptations and hopefully change with you and have some camaraderie with other people that are doing it too, because the more social support you can get for people who are staying on the program, you're not so lonely, it's not so difficult. So the wonderful work you're doing, Junior, at giving people a support structure, helping them with the food, giving them information, and connecting them to a network of others who are also doing this, those are all very critical steps they need to do to make this work. Thank you. Well, Dr. Furman, I, I thought that this was going to be a very long talk, but now I feel it was a very short talk and time just flew, flew, flew. So uh, I want to thank you for taking the time. I hope that this time that you have spent has helped somebody make a change and add a decade or more to their life and, and the joy of all their family members. So Dr. Furman, namaste from India. And uh, thank you, a pleasure as always. Same here, so happy to have this opportunity to, to reach out and, and hope that people have great health and much happiness. Thank you so much. And for the audience, thank you for joining. I did uh, send my email address in the chat if you have any questions. And uh, I hope you guys enjoyed it as well. And thank you for joining. I think Dr. Furman has left. I am, I am be happy to stick around if anybody has any questions. Um, I see, uh, let me see if there's any questions I couldn't get to. Food addict, dairy. Uh, there's a question from Rohit Singh that says, uh, soya bean are so GMO modified and are they advised? So it's correct, soya bean is very GMO modified today, but so is wheat, so is dairy, so is a so many things, uh, so are so many things. So one should keep a balance of what they eat. But one of the easiest, uh, most impactful things I heard right now is, for example, when we talk about dairy, nowadays when uh, a cow gives birth to a calf, within X number of weeks, they impregnate the cow again. So now she's producing milk while at the same time she is having enzymes that is causing growth in her body for this new child. Now what's gonna happen when you drink that milk? You're also gonna likely see those enzymes have a similar effect on you because you're a mammal too. So I think we're getting bombarded with GMO and with hormones and with antibiotics and we see the result of that. So I think everything in moderation, if you can go all organic, hands down, do it. That's what I would want to feed my parents and my children. Uh, I see a question uh, about liquor in a moderate dose. Um, I spoke to Dr. Furman about it. Now he would say absolutely no, even no to wine. Uh, I would say if you're having liquor without adding uh, sugary mixers in a moderate dose, it is fine, but it would not be the perfect diet. So depending on your health, you can decide if you wanna go with that or you wanna avoid it completely. You know, sometimes there are also stages in life so if you're 35, maybe you want to indulge a little bit, but as I see with my parents, as they get older, they are less attracted to these indulgences. And um, I think we've covered a lot of questions. Uh, I have a question regarding insulin and having black dots around the ankle and foot skin. I would uh, want to take that question uh, offline. Uh, my email is junior at lifeheal.in. I don't want to comment on medical issues with inadequate information and say something wrong. 
And I think I've covered most of the questions. I hope this was enjoyable. I certainly enjoyed it. And I want to thank everyone uh, for, oh, I see a question on ghee. Again, a lot of schools of thoughts. Um, there's a lot of good doctors out there. Dr. Furman obviously being one of the leaders. Dr. Furman is against all forms of oil and dairy. So ghee is a junction of both being an oil and being a dairy product. But then you have the other community, which is the keto community, which would swear by ghee. So I would say, uh, you know, follow one school or another. Don't become your own doctor and start mixing keto with vegan or keto with nutritarian, which is Dr. Furman's, which is nuts, seeds, beans, greens, berries, mushrooms, what he calls the G-bombs. So, you know, I think you get into a lot of trouble if you mix these things. If you're going for a keto lifestyle and that's what you want to do, I would not do keto for long term. I, I actually don't think keto is healthy for long term. I prefer vegan. Uh, I like the nutritarian diet. But sometimes in India, if you've got help coming at home and cooking for you, you may not have the choice of eating oil free, in which case having a good oil like a ghee is excellent. I would definitely stay away from refined oil if I can impart one thing to another. All right, guys, thank you so much. Namaste and be safe. This is a great time to take care of your health. I think if you're healthy, coronavirus is not a big deal for you. So talk about health and get this beneficial circle around you because you're going to need the support structure to change and support these changes that you need to make. Thank you and good night.